Yanis Dosios. I'm the VP of the Flurry Network. Um, first of all, a very quick uh, note about Flurry. Uh, I think many of you may have heard of the company. Uh, we're the largest mobile analytics uh, tracker uh, today. We track about 120,000 mobile applications worldwide. Um, there are 97 or 98 percent, so 97 or 98 percent of uh, smartphone devices use our analytics today worldwide. Um, the goal of the company is to use this data to provide mobile app developers with uh, better measurement, better acquisition, and better monetization of their mobile audience. Uh, just some you know, stats by the company. Um, we track about 330 million devices, 20 billion sessions a month, so that's about 15,000 sessions per second, uh, about three times, the times of the, three times the data that Twitter processes on any given day. Uh, and we're one of the largest users of Hadoop. Um, on top of that, we have an advertising and monetization network called AppCircle, and what we do is we use all the analytics, which is free, uh, to target the advertisements to users based on what the users have done in our network. So it's really high-quality targeted uh, traffic acquisition. So in a nutshell, what we do. Uh, but what we want to talk about today is um, the mobile explosion and, and what is driving it. Um, oh, everyone knows about it, but there's, uh, there's three big factors um, that, uh, that drive it. Uh, I think what we're experiencing right now is the most significant um, shift in adoption of a consumer technology that we've lived in our lifetime, and it's possible that, the, that we may live in our lifetime until the end. So it's, uh, it's a very fascinating what's happening, the adoption of mobile devices and mobile applications. We had the PC revolution in the 80s, the internet boom of the 90s, and now mobile computing has really taken off at a speed that's uh, unparalleled. Uh, and there's three things I want to cover about what is driving this. There's more, but there's three that I want to cover. One is the install base of devices, of smart devices, has been growing really rapidly. Uh, the second thing is there's a content distribution layer that's really easy and frictionless that's uh, built on top of that, which makes content extremely easy to create and distribute. And the third thing is that there's a monetization capability on top of that content that's really promising and that's enabling anyone to really make significant revenue on mobile applications. So first of all, about smartphone uh, devices, first of all about mobile phones themselves, including smartphones and feature phones. The uh, install base of phones uh, is actually 4 billion right now. It's actually grown a little bit further than this. Um, that's larger than the PC and TV uh, install base combined, so that's not really a surprise. Uh, what's interesting, just looking, I have, in this presentation I have data both from Flurry and from other providers. Um, what's interesting is the breakdown of the mobile uh, shipments globally by feature phones or non-smartphones versus smartphones, uh, green being the smartphones and blue being the feature phones. Um, and it's interesting that obviously the, the, the growth in the adoption of smartphones is very, very rapid. Uh, still, uh, it's at the beginning, as you can see here. We're here in 2011. There's dramatic room for growth in uh, mobile app, uh, smartphone shipments, which means that if you're an app developer and you're thinking about getting into mobile, it's not too late for sure. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that uh, they're becoming more mainstream with uh, lowering price points, especially on Android devices. Um, and the penetration is really high on the U.S. and European markets, which have higher income as well, which makes this uh, even more compelling. A lot of people are talking about iOS versus Android. Who's going to win it? It's a two-horse race. It's really interesting that uh, in May or June of this year, the, the daily... Uh, activations of phones with Android surpassed for the first time the daily activations of iOS devices. Um, so that is actually not a surprise, to be honest with you, when you have so many providers like HTC, Motorola, Samsung, LG adopting Android more uh, than Apple. Um, it doesn't mean that necessarily people are making an OR decision. It's a sequencing decision. People are increasingly saying, we're going to make an iPhone application and then port it over to Android. Um, and uh, the question is, which one do they do first? So it's a sequencing decision rather than an exclusive one or the other. Uh, we do know that iPhone, at least for now, monetizes better than uh, Android devices. Uh, based on analysis from Flurry, where we've tracked 120,000 apps, when we look at the same application in, uh, in an iPhone format, in an Android format, the uh, Android format typically um, monetizes between 25 and 50 percent of the level of the iPhone application. So. Uh, and I think anecdotally you may have heard this. So I think there's a lot of room for growth on the Android side to be more, to provide a platform that more effectively drives usage and monetization, as you, as you may know. It may become a three-horse race. Uh, we'd love for that to happen. I think it's good for consumers when that happens, when they have choice. Uh, big contenders, uh, Windows with Nokia, Amazon, RIM. Um, Windows with Nokia, the one that's most uh, visible and that 
been making most of the, of the noise. Uh, Windows does know how to make a good operating system, obviously, and their latest Mango uh, operating system for mobile has a lot of promise. Uh, they also know how to build a developer community, and they have a lot of assets with MSN, NextBLA, productivity apps. Um, also, the hardware partnership with Nokia remains to be seen how effective that's going to be. But the biggest challenge that they're facing is uh, developer adoption of the platform. The number of available applications is very, very limited, and uh, it's a very difficult chicken and egg problem. So they're going to have to really um, do something special if they're going to really become a, a big uh, contender. In analytics, uh, the, in our analytics that we track, uh, less than 2% of the new application starts are with Windows uh, right now. Um, the one that, in my opinion, is the most promising of the platforms is Amazon. They have a lot of the right assets in place already. They just need to bring it all together. Uh, they can leverage a, a very effective device in Kindle Fire, uh, which they've upgraded with you know, full color screen, deals with game makers, movies, lots of great content. So they have lots of content that they're building on. They have the uh, commerce engine, and they happen to have the second largest credit card aggregator, th to be the second largest credit card aggregator. Um, and they have the consumer trust. Uh, so I think this is a, a contender that we're watching very closely, and I think in the next year may emerge as a very, very strong potential third candidate. RIM is a little bit behind. Um, there has been, obviously, concerns about RIM, as you may have read uh, in the press. Um, I think fundamentally, you know, one thing to note is that they've built their whole system with communication in mind, not necessarily with applications in mind. And I think that's making it really hard for developers to adopt it as a, as a platform. So moving over to applications, and I'm going a bit quickly just because we want to make sure we, we get to everything. Um, it's really interesting to note that content that, migrate, my, that took about 15 years to migrate from traditional forms to the, the web online um, is now moving to applications at a much, fire, much faster pace uh, within three years or less. So it took you know, newspapers, movies, um, TV, and games uh, about 10 to 15 years to move to the web in earnest. Uh, it's taken about three years in mobile with apps like you know, the New York Times, Netflix, Rovio's, Angry Birds. And think of each of the applications really as a, uh, as really as a, as a platform itself. Uh, so it's um, like New York Times itself is a way to deliver news inside mobile applications. So I think you know, the main reason that this is happening is that people are, have learned. They know what they're doing. Um, they're moving uh, the mo content creation really fast and there's very low friction to entering the new mobile app economy. So who is actually uh, creating applications? So everyone is jumping in the fray. Who are the mobile application developers today? Um, so there's over 600,000 apps in the, uh, in the iOS market, as you, as you know. Um, the sources of them are very broad. So you have mobile 5%. These are the people who were creating applications on feature phones early. So it's a very small percentage uh, of the early vanguard that are moving to uh, the smartphone mobile applications. You've got online companies, so companies that developed a lot of applications on Facebook, about a quarter uh, of the makeup is them. You have native iPhone applications, so people who develop for the first time applications and games for the iPhone. You have traditional gaming companies uh, like EA and Ubisoft. Um, you have traditional media. Um, you have retail and CPG, so pretty much everyone. It's an amazing um, growth in mobile app developers, the fastest adoption among app developers as a, from, a, from a platform point of view ever. And the customers are responding. It's really interesting. This is part of the, uh, in the Flurry blog, we, we issued this report later this, uh, earlier this year. Uh, for the first time in June of this year, uh, mobile uh, applications consumed more of a person's time than the web on any given day. Uh, so uh, in June, it was 74 minutes per day people were using the web. 81 minutes they were using mobile applications. Uh, and this was you know, mo almost doubled versus a year just prior. Um, so the question that comes up here is, is this cannibalizing uh, people's time or is this additive? And I think the answer is both. Uh, I think that uh, online usage would have grown even faster if there wasn't a mobile alternative, but I think that uh, mobile is actually entering people's lives at moments when they were not using any technology before. Um, it's kind of, it fits everywhere. It's, it's pretty much, uh, think of it as a snack versus a meal, and it replaces the spare time, whether it's five minutes waiting for the train to arrive, or whether it's just five minutes procrastinating, it, it's a perfect um, alternative. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this chart, which is a little bit hard to read, illustrates that even more. Uh, what we've done here with our Flare Analytics is look at, um, it's called day part comparison. Each line represents one medium. Blue is television, green is internet, and red is mobile applications, iOS and Android. 
and the lines represent at any given hour of the day what percentage of the active users of this medium are actually using the medium. So what's interesting, for example, if you look at 9 a.m., this would tell you that there's about 15 to 20 percent of television and internet users using those mediums, and about 25, 28 to 30 percent of iOS and Android uh, users using uh, those applications. What's interesting is that TV shows you the, the very big curve that we're always used to. There's the prime time that all the shows go after. It's between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., really 7 to 10 p.m. What's interesting about um, the uh, iOS and Android apps is that there's no such clear prime time, that throughout the day, from 7 a.m. all the way till 11 p.m., people are very actively using their phones, most of the day over 30 percent. And given the fact that there are about 110 million people who are active iOS and Android users per day in the United States today, this means that uh, for those 17 days, you have over 20 million people each hour accessing their mobile devices which is the equivalent of 17 American idols every single day being reached through mobile devices. Uh, it's an amazing change in consumer behavior um, because people just really are attached to their phones at all times. In terms of what applications uh, people are using, um, the initial downloads that we'll track again through Fleur Analytics uh, by category, you see there's a very significant tail. You have the games, which we'll talk more about in this panel, entertainment, utilities, the list is very, very long. But uh, if you really try to aggregate them into the applications that people spend the most time on, it really gets quite concentrated. So games account for about 47% of the time spent of, of mobile users today. Uh, uh, social networking, which includes IM, is about a third. And then you get about just under 10% for news and then entertainment. I should note that Flurry is not tracking Facebook. So if we were tracking Facebook, I think the social networking would have been an even larger part of this pie. The interesting thing about the audience is that it's um, highly desirable for mobile applications. It used to, there used to be almost a stigma that advertisers did not want to reach gamers because the, for some reason they weren't as likely to engage with the brands or not as desirable. Uh, that is simply not the case with mobile um, applications and mobile games. Uh, we've done a study about mobile gamers. Um, among our base. Uh, one of the things that's interesting that the Flurry does is we actually get a lot of people to report their age and gender inside our uh, analytics and we also have an extrapolation algorithm on top of that that uh, estimates with a high degree of certainty the age and gender of different users. So we are able to tell what is the demographic makeup of game players in mobile phones. So what's interesting is um, first of all on the income side mobile gamers are about 50 percent higher than the average household income uh, in terms of the education, it's more than double the likelihood of being a uh, university degree or higher, so well-educated. And also what's not shown here is that there's a very good mix between male and female. Uh, actually, there's a slight edge to women, 53% women, 47% men, and most of them in the 20 to 30 age range. So think of the mid-20-year-old, male or female, high income, well-educated. Who does not want to reach this audience as an advertiser or a brand? So really, really uh, valuable audience. In terms of monetization, going to the third piece, so we talked about now you know, the, smart, the device, of device penetration and the content platform. In terms of monetization, um, basically we have uh, in iOS and Android uh, a very good monetization platform that when you look at ARPU, uh, revenue per user uh, per day, uh, it rivals many of the other platforms. So this study is actually done from ADO strategies um, and what they calculated is the total annual revenue related to all the offerings that each of those providers offers in the market today um, and combine the annual revenue for any given user from all those offerings. So for example, Google includes all the Google properties, Gmail, Gtalk, Maps, Search, AdWords, AdSense, um, and that gives you about $18 per user per year. Uh, you got Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook. In the iOS side, uh, we actually tracked uh, using Flare Analytics uh, then we took a snapshot of all the freemium, so free-to-play within our purchases, games, um, and we looked at what the revenue per game per user was uh, per, uh, per year. And you see, you, show, you see that this is actually the second highest, is about $15 per user per year compared to about 18 for Google. Um, and the interesting thing is that this revenue is being made by the middle class, if you will, or any of a large number of uh, app developers that do not need to be large companies. There can be two or three people working out of their studio or their garage. Um, and this is the power that it's really, um, really impressive how quickly and easily someone with uh, low barriers
can create an application that monetizes that well. In terms of the types of apps that are generating this revenue, back in January of 2011, if you looked at the iOS top 100 uh, grossing apps, uh, about 60% of them, 61% would be apps that were premium. Basically, you needed to pay a dollar or more, let's say, to actually download the application. And 39% were freemium, so free to play within our purchases. Well, just six months later, this was completely turned on its head. Uh, right now, about two thirds of the top 100 grossing games are uh, freemium, so free applications with uh, in-app purchases. And uh, just about a third is premium applications that you have to pay up front. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. The, the free applications get dramatically faster adoption. People are really looking for the free apps. But what's really interesting is that people are willing to pay inside the application if the currency is right and if, the, um, if what the currency enables you to do uh, is of value. Uh, so there's a very big shift to the freemium model and, and a big shift to the gamification, if you will, not just in games but in other, other types of applications where there's an introduction of virtual currency that may let you, for example, in Pandora, turn off the ads for a day or you know, in New York Times may, may give you some free content for a certain period of time. Um, so that's really a pervasive business model. So who pays? Who are the uh, people who pay most? Which are the demographics that you guys should be uh, developing applications for? Um, it's really interesting that I as a general rule of thumb, the younger audience, you know, under 24, tend to be heavy users, and the older audience, you know, above 25, <laughs> old is above 25, hmm, God help us. But the older audience um, above 25 are the ones that are the, the higher monetizers. Um, between men and women, it's interesting that between the big groups of 25 to 34, which is the highest monetizing group, men are actually uh, are more likely to be, uh, have a higher portion of the, of the spending pie than women. Um, and if you actually look into this a little bit in more detail, uh, you'll see that men and women are actually fairly equally likely to be making in-app purchases. It's just that men, when they're making in-app purchases, they're, they're bingers. They actually spend significantly more per in-app purchase. So men are more compulsive uh, in terms of making the, uh, the purchases, whereas women are a little bit more thoughtful um, about it. And in terms of uh, mobile campaigns, so we talked a lot about in-app purchases. The, uh, the other um, big revenue stream is around advertising. So mobile app developers are using advertising to make revenues. Uh, this could be in the form of um, application recommendations, so they get paid for driving installs of other applications. Uh, it could be also through other forms of advertising, such as video advertising. Recently, there's a big growth in video advertising. Uh, Flurry actually launched uh, an advertising offering, uh, which included people seeing video clips um, about six months ago. But what's interesting about this is that the effectiveness of uh, advertising campaigns that run on mobile is significantly higher than uh, the effectiveness of campaigns that run on online uh, across the entire spectrum of how people measure the effectiveness of marketing campaigns, whether it's the unaided awareness of a service or the aided awareness or the actual awareness about what the service does, specific association with messages, favorability of the brand, and, and eventually purchase intent. So advertisers are seeing this and an increasing number of dollars are moving into mobile advertising. The other thing that's really interesting is uh, just looking at specifically the um, video clip advertising offering that Flurry provides we have seen that the quality of the customers that application developers acquire through mobile advertising is significantly higher than their average users. So people who come, uh, for example, with, um, who watch a 15 second video clip and then they install an application, they are about 33% more likely to make an in-app purchase in that application versus the average application user, which is uh, very significantly better than any other uh, paid acquisition campaign uh, that we've seen to date. So there's going to be a lot of room for um, growth and improvement in targeting uh, mobile application uh, campaigns, um, and the medium is very effective. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.